On this episode of Newt's World, we have to recognize that in 2017, Americans were more likely to die of an opioid overdose than from a car accident. In fact, one out of every 96 Americans die from an opioid overdose. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, from 1999 to 2017, more than 700,000 Americans have died from a drug overdose. Among the 47,600 opioid-involved overdose deaths in the United States in 2017, 58.8% involved synthetic opioids, particularly illicitly manufactured fentanyl, which has been fueling the U.S. overdose epidemic. The opioid mortality rate contributed to the third straight yearly decline in life expectancy in the United States. The opioid crisis is now an epidemic. But this isn't just about drug addiction. It's also about our national security. We are never going to resolve this crisis until we address the drugs coming over our southern border. Mexico has become what some would describe as a narco state. We'll talk about policies that need to change in order for our government agencies to fight this war. I'm pleased to welcome my guests, Missy and Michael Owen, co-founders of the Davis Direction Foundation, and Sarah Carter, an investigative journalist who reported from the border for over 10 years. She is currently a Fox News contributor and host of the Sarah Carter Show podcast. Coming up, Sarah Carter makes the case for Mexican drug cartels to be designated as foreign terrorist organizations. Could you share with us how you got into the whole business of investigative reporting and over the years, what you have focused on? In 2004, 2005, I told my editors, I want to go to the U.S.-Mexico border. I want to go to Mexico. I want to find out what the real story is here. That began my long career. And when I reached the border, I saw things that I never thought existed. Could, I could have been imagined the security failures, the loopholes, the porous border situation, Mexican military in the pocket of the drug cartels, people on our side of the border in law enforcement in the pocket of the drug cartels because they've amassed so much money. They've been able to buy people. They've been able to blackmail people. The inability for us to actually match the resources that the drug cartels had and the very real and dangerous situation that our nation faced. September 11th, 2001, I think, was a wake-up call for everybody in this nation that there were enemies out there, and these enemies lived in the shadows. There were these drug cartels that, without any ideology whatsoever, with no loyalty to neither their country, nor ours, nor humanity, were willing to do anything and everything for money and power. And that means being able to transport anything that they wanted if the price was high enough across the U.S.-Mexico border. So I spent my career there at the border covering stories from California near the Tijuana estuary all the way up to Matamoros, Mexico, along the Texas border. I remember I came across tunnel systems. I interviewed criminals on the Mexican side of the border getting ready to come into the United States. I uncovered the fact that the Mexican military had actually assisting the drug cartels at that time, moving their contraband in here. It opened up a huge, wide range of stories. I plan on going to Mexico this year. I know the situation is extraordinarily dangerous, but I think it's worth the risk because this is a story that affects our security as Americans. These people operate like terrorists. And the only way that we can fix this is by telling the truth and getting that information out to the American public so that they can make the right decisions with their leadership on how to handle it. When you look at all this and you look at how, in many ways, the cartels have gotten stronger, more violent, 
and more dangerous. What do you see as the strategy that will break them? I think the only way to break these guys is to target their finances and to put them on the line. That means designating them foreign terrorist organizations, telling them that we're not going to put up with this anymore. This isn't going to be the same decades-long battle that we've seen in the past because it's never going to end. We have to let them know that we mean business, that we are going to take them on, and that they will not get away with this. We have a president now that can do this. And I know he's deliberating this right now. But the most important thing is to realize that the only way to combat these people at this point in time is to put them on notice, to put them on call and to say, this is unacceptable. We are not going to do this anymore. We're not going to lose hundreds of thousands of our citizens because you're poisoning our country. And now you're bringing in and you're manufacturing fentanyl, a deadly synthetic opioid. You've crossed all lines. And they understand that, believe me. When they see that FTO designation, they will understand that. We've seen this in the past. We have people there right now, great men and women, training and assisting the Mexican government. But Manuel Lopez Obrador, the president, does not want to do his job. He wants to play this game and placate the drug cartels, and that can't happen anymore. In a situation where you have the Mexican president opposed to you, how do we operate? Look, the Mexican government, unfortunately, because this has been so exacerbated for decades, has become a part of the problem. And I say this because... They've basically been bought, some of them, not all of them. There are some great people in the federal government that want to fight this, but their lives are on the line. Their families are being threatened. Every time they raise their hand to the drug cartels or try to stop it, something happens. A politician gets targeted or killed. Reporters are killed. One of the most dangerous places in the world to report from is Mexico. You're putting your life on the line every time you cross into Mexico as a journalist to tell the story. Brave journalists from Mexico have been killed or injured or their family members have been killed. So this is a very serious situation. What has happened in Mexico is effectively a shadow government and some would say a narco state. So it's understandable why President Manuel Lopez Obrador would be so frightened of taking them on. We've seen it in the past. We've seen them strong arm. We've also seen them buy out people, very high level officials. So in an effort to target them, we need to go one level up. We need to say, you know what? Not the same game. We're not going to wait for Mexico to throw us a bone like El Chapo after decades of running the Sinaloa cartel. He figures even the Mexican government and people in there, remember, they're playing games with other cartels here. They'll throw us a bone. They'll throw us Chapo. Chapo has outlived his time. He's caused too much trouble. Let's throw the U.S. a bone, and then they'll get quiet again. We can't get quiet anymore. We need to focus on these terrorists, which is what they are, these mass murderers. We need to tell them we are at war with you, not just our government, but the people of America need to stand up and say, we're not going to tolerate this anymore. This isn't just about drug addiction. This is about you poisoning our country. If we don't do something, we're taking a gamble. The United States government has the resources and the capacity to target these cartels. We have very well-trained military personnel. We also have people within the DEA, within the FBI. And if our agencies could for once just cooperate and work together and be held accountable, That's the big thing here. We are never going to resolve the crisis until our agencies are held accountable and can show actual progress, that they're working together to target them. So even if we designate them foreign terrorist organizations, if those agencies aren't sharing information and cooperating together, we're not going to be successful. The only way we're going to be successful is if we work together to find a common solution. 
And if we designate them foreign terrorist organizations, and I'm talking about maybe the top three or the top four drug cartels in Mexico, we seize their accounts. We seize where they're laundering their money. We seize those businesses. We work with the Mexican government and we root out corruption inside Mexico and inside the United States. Then we can make progress. Well, look, I want to thank you. Thank you so much, Newt. Next, what we can do to protect all Americans from the opioid epidemic. Hi, this is Newt. I'd like to invite you to join my inner circle. It is a digital subscription club where you go beyond the Newt's World podcast to access extra content on the topics you enjoy, attend member-only online events, and get my political analysis and context on the 2020 election. Go to newtsinnercircle.com and become a member. It's a place for you to get involved, share ideas, and learn from my team of experts. Join the Inner Circle today at NewtsInnerCircle.com. The first 500 yearly subscribers will receive a limited Newt's Inner Circle gift as part of their membership. Join NewtsInnerCircle.com today. That's N-E-W-T-S-InnerCircle.com. We've theoretically been fighting a war on drugs at least since the early 1970s, but we remain the primary purchaser. So to some extent, the system exists because Americans are willing to pay money to sustain the system. And I think there are four parts to this. One is, what's our strategy for helping Mexico become a healthy state again? What is our strategy for stopping or dramatically limiting the flow of drugs? What's our strategy for destroying the cartels? And then what's our strategy for the kids? If you look at the number of suicides and the number of drug addictions, there is a spiritual crisis here that doesn't fit our political language, but that's real. Any serious American strategy has to take into account those kind of challenges. We have no strategy either for drug addiction in America or for defeating the cartels in Mexico. And that puts us, I think, at real risk. Thank you to my guests, Missy and Michael Owen and Sarah Carter. You can read more about the Davis Direction Foundation and get a link to the documentary, Not in Vain, on our show page at newtsworld.com. Newt's World is produced by Westwood One. Please email me with your comments at newt at newtsworld.com. If you've been enjoying Newt's World, I hope you'll go to Apple Podcasts and both rate us with five stars and give us a review so others can learn what it's all about. I'm Newt Gingrich. This is Newt's World. The Westwood One Podcast Network. Cheryl Atkinson is investigative reporter. She's the host of Full Measure with Cheryl Atkinson. Uh, and uh, she joins us now. Uh, welcome to the program, Cheryl. Why, thank you. Thanks for having me. Sure. So everybody said, well, not everybody, the, the press made you uh, look like a loon and a crazy person when you were reporting the facts on Benghazi. And then I'll never forget the video that you you took. Maybe you were in a hotel room or something. I can't I can't remember exactly, but I remember you having on your phone tape of someone turning on your computer and I think deleting things from your computer. Was that what was happening? Well, that was way after the initial forensics and discovery of the government intrusion on a third computer. Yes, while I was working, uh, there was a remote access and hyper quick deletion before my very eyes of something that is not possible to do by holding down a key yourself or anything like that. And yes, Media Matters launched an effort to talk to a supposed forensics expert who'd never looked at any of these computers who declared I was holding down my 
backspace key or that it was stuck and therefore none of the computer intrusion story was true and it was all just, you know, sort of made up craziness. Mm -hmm. I don't, I think, and I don't think it took hold as much as they hoped. I mean, that was widely reported in the liberal press, but um, I do think most people understood we have and had the forensics that prove the government intrusion from the start. And now, as you said, we have a federal agent, former federal agent involved in the surveillance who has uh, admitted being part of it and helped us with some information. Okay, so tell me how that came about. How did you how did you get this? How did this guy flip or this woman flip? Uh, and and why? The lawsuit um, that I fought for about six years at great expense with the government fighting every step of the way. So I never got a page of discovery was ultimately mm. dismissed last year with the main judge, although there was a great dissenting judge who disagreed, but the main judge saying, I should have the names of the agents, not just the forensic proof showing the government did it. I needed to know the names of the people who were involved. And we argued we can't do that unless we get discovery. So it was this horrible loop. Right. Um, but we put out sort of an all call for information because we were at a dead end, if that's what was required. And we were contacted by a number of people that had been vetted, not by me. So I have limited information, but my attorneys have been researching and vetting people for four to five months. And as for motivation, I don't know, except it could be, you know, these are shady characters involved in doing this. You can imagine the federal agents who'd be willing to do illegal surveillance on lots of Americans, according to this information, not just me. That's all along why this was important. It wasn't because of me. But uh, one of the people we name in the lawsuit is a former Secret Service agent who's in prison for other government corruption already. So these are the kinds of people you're dealing with that you have to sort through the truth and sort through their information. And, and my vetters think that they have very good information now. Will it be enough to convince the judge to let us open this case with the names? I don't know. So, Cheryl, it would, it would be kind of uh, comforting to know that these were all rogue agents um, but do you believe that that is true? Is that what the evidence is showing you, that these might be all rogue agents, or was there coordination? There was, according to our information, coordination out of a sort of a task force, you could call it, run out of the U.S. Attorney's Office in Baltimore at the time under then-U.S. Attorney Rod Rosenstein with a task force of people that included FBI, Secret Service, um, contractors that were tasked sometimes to ATF, DEA, Secret Service, and FBI. This is a group that, and I believe this is just my theory based on information I have from people who work on the inside, there are numerous dark groups that do work like this totally outside the FISA process. I mean, people have asked whether FISA warrants should be approved, but we knew all along there was no FISA warrant on me. I had sources that told me that. So we knew all along that the spying on me was done outside the system entirely, sort of this extra legal system that happens, um, yes, I believe, with the knowledge of important people inside the Department of Justice. Therefore, Glenn, we're at this loggerheads where no matter what we know, even if the guys bring themselves in handcuffs to me or to the government, or to the courts, if Department of Justice doesn't want to hear it, doesn't want to prosecute themselves, it still goes nowhere unless there's, I guess, somehow enough public pressure for people to say do something. So uh, the the Justice Department, uh, I mean, we've lost we've lost justice and intelligence in this uh, country in more ways than one. But those two departments, I think, are really, really screwed up. Uh, they were um, they were turning a blind eye uh, at at best but I think the corruption starts at the very, very top. Is there any indication to you that any of this stuff, because, I mean, Trump is, is, is paying the price for this kind of corruption himself uh, right now. Is there any, any clue that this stuff is going to be cleaned up? Is there anybody that is, is ri going to ride into the rescue here? So far, sadly, no. I mean, nothing has changed for us in fighting our lawsuit at Department of Justice between the Obama administration and the Trump administration. The same people are still fighting it 
They don't seem to care about the forensics, which, again, these are undeniable forensics. It's not something you can dispute as to whether the government's software and the government's IP addresses were involved. They're still fighting it instead of doing the obvious, which they should say, boy, this is serious. We need to get to the bottom of who may have done this. They're, they're you know, in essence, covering up and obstructing. And I, I don't know what to do about that except to say that, in my view, there are still people in important places that don't want things like this to come to light. And I think that's in part because, as I said, this is way bigger than just the surveillance on me. Who cares about that other than me? But this was done, we believe, and our information says, on hundreds of innocent U.S. citizens and other journalists. I just happen to have the intel contacts to get the forensics exam and and prove it. So tell me exactly what they were doing to you and what you think they might be doing to others. They were around March of 2011 um, surveilling me, ATF agents who were involved in exposing the illegal Fast and Furious operation that the government had denied at first, moving weapons into a sovereign nation of Mexico into the hands of Mexican drug cartels. And they were ineffectively monitoring everything I did on my computer through government software proprietary only to the U.S. government intel agencies that we see in our computer, in my computers, while I was at CBS. So they could monitor all my keystrokes. They got into the CBS program. CBS announced this, by the way. There's not any disputing this, that you know, the programs were, their computers were infiltrated, not just my forensics, but we hired a separate forensics team at CBS that confirmed uh, the intrusions. And um, they were able to use Skype. You know, I don't use Skype anymore because I didn't know at the time. It can be activated silently by government or government software. They can listen in on what your conversations are without you knowing it, and they can exfiltrate files through Skype, which they did. Um, they had which means they can go in. Which means they can go in and take files that you have on your computer that are not related to Skype and take them right. without you knowing. Yeah. Right. They could remotely operate my computer at any given time. You know, they can set up an operation where they can access it as if they were sitting at your computer. I mean, all kinds of things. And basically wanting to know, I assume, what I was working on, what I was about to report, and most importantly, what Obama officials or administration folks were talking to me and giving me the information that I was using to break stories with. When the war broke out in 1939, again, there was the continental power of Italy and Germany and their Eastern European allies, along with the collusion of the Soviet Union under the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. But the United States was 3,000 miles distant in the Atlantic from the theaters in Europe, and even more so in the Pacific from what was going on in Southeast Asia and China. And so the question was, if you're an Axis power and you have declared war on the United States, as happened in December of 1941, how do you reach it? If you don't have four-engine bombers that can bomb the mainland, do you have a mechanism to send a ship over that can either, what, bombard the shore? Well, that could, at best, that could be 20 miles. But do you have an aircraft carrier that can send bombers that hit Detroit? Again, the answer is no. So in the case of relative naval strength, the war breaks out with some pretty stark realities. Number one, Italy, which has the largest navy after the collapse of the French navy in the Mediterranean, it has the largest navy in the Mediterranean, does not build a single aircraft carrier. Germany does not build a single aircraft carrier. It's almost analogous to their failure to achieve a four-engine bomber program. In other words, they do not have a mechanism to transmit naval power in a way that would hurt the mainland and the industrial center of their enemies in the United States uh, or Russia or along Russian, Russia's coast or Great Britain. In contrast, the United States starts the war 
with six aircraft carriers, fleet carriers, that is larger or almost as large as 20,000 tons of displacement and above, and Britain has about seven. And more importantly, there's been a revolutionary change in thinking about naval power before the war starts that will see the United States create orders for more aircraft carriers than all of the navies combined in World War II. And Britain has the same change of thinking, at least on the drawing boards when the war breaks out. Now, the Axis have some advantages. Unlike air power, they haven't quite made the same catastrophic mistakes. They are captives to interwar naval thinking, which puts a great primacy on the battleship. According to the naval theories of the great uh, strategist Alfred Mahan, the idea was that if you could destroy the enemy's warships at sea, then like a wolf among sheep, you could send a dreadnought or a battleship through an enemy convoy and just be unstoppable in your destruction. You could just fire salvo after salvo and nothing could stop you. Once trench warfare ossified conflict on the Western Front in World War I, there was a desperate need to break up that slog, that quagmire. Part of the solution was in air power, but the British had discovered at Cambrai that if they made a vehicle with an inter internal combustion engine and they armored the size and put a machine gun or a small cannon on it, then in theory you couldn't stop it. It would run over men and their bullets would bounce off. And out of that experience of somewhat limited success, but nevertheless success of getting through German trenches, there became a race to make armored vehicles. And by, in fact, the end of World War I, there were several thousand tanks in the American and French and British Army, although the Germans really didn't build any at all. During the period between World War I and World War II, the idea of tanks as sort of the mother of all bot, uh, the mother of all weapons on the battlefield took hold. And it was analogous to prophets of air power, prophets of strategic bombing, just as people like Billy Mitchell and Duet in Italy had said, the bomber will change warfare. There were people in Britain, uh, Liddell Hart, General Fuller, people in Germany, Hans Guderian, who said, no, what will change warfare is an armored vehicle that's reliable on the ground, and it will plunge through enemy lines and adjudicate all ground fighting. It was kind of analogous to the idea of the primacy of the battleship. Unleash a battleship, once it destroys its counterparts, it gets in like a wolf among sheep in a convoy, and there's nothing around that can stop it. It'll just blow apart uh, ships that are transporting needed materiel. And the same thing would be true on the battlefield. Once you have a tank force that bursts through the enemy's formations, how can you stop it? And it will just go on ad infinitum and take territory and win the war outright. This was very influential when World War II started. Nobody quite knew what a tank should be, though. So if you looked at tanks and the relative militaries, uh, they were quite different. Should a tank have one cannon or two? Should it be like the Char B tank in France or the American Lee and Grant that had two cannon? Should it have a 30 caliber machine gun or a 50 caliber machine gun or maybe three machine guns in addition to the cannon? Should it have narrow tracks and sort of uh, go faster or wide tracks and it would be more stable? Should it have sloped armor that would make it a little bit more uncomfortable inside the tank but provide greater protection or straight sides? How big should the turret be? Should it have two men, three men that can help load? Should it have a radio? Should it have a diesel engine which would uh, provide more reliability and diesel fuel, although there, you get fewer gallons per barrel of oil, is a little bit cheaper as a first stage of refinement, and it has better mileage than a gasoline engine, and it's not as likely to ignite when the tank is hit, or it should have gasoline that uh, is, you get more you know, gallons of gas per bar barrel of oil, but more importantly, gas is easier to start in the winter, in winter operations. So where there's this great, a conundrum that nobody quite knew 
what a tank should look like, even what it should be. How big should the gun be? 37 millimeters, 50 millimeters, 75 millimeters. Those challenges were, by 1945, as we saw with airplanes and ground soldiers, they reached another consensus. So as the war got into sophisticated armor operations, especially on the eastern and western fronts, by 1944, there was an, I guess we could use the term, ur tank. There was a standard vision that all sides shared about what it would be the most successful tank. It should be somewhere between 25 and 30 tons. Anything bigger than 30, it was hard to transport. It was hard to cross bridges with it. Anything less, and it was too vulnerable. It could be, it could uh, be easily destroyed by artillery or air power or other tanks. It should have tracks that are wider so it could prevent slippage. It should have a low profile. It shouldn't be like a Sherman tank that stuck up too high and made an easy target. It, it should have a gun that was at least 75 millimeters and preferably 76 or even 88 or 90 millimeters. And although the Germans never really built a diesel fuel tank, the Americans only did a few uh, Sherman models that were diesel fueled and the British didn't use diesel at all. The Russians with their T-34 tank had discovered that diesel was the ideal fuel because of uh, problems of igniting that gas offered. And so, and their diesel aluminum engines were very, very uh, efficient. They were reliable. So at the end of the war, the idea was you want a 30 ton tank with 76 millimeters and above. It should be diesel powered, et cetera. But it took thousands of tank crews to be killed and wounded to find out what was the preferable tank. The first question that looms over all others, did World War II end in the way that people had imagined, or particularly, did the winning side gain their objectives? If those objectives are defined in one particular manner, the answer is no, and another yes. Let's look at the failures of the Allied causes. World War I had promised us a perpetual peace. The Versailles Treaty was a way to make sure that the war would end all other wars, and it failed. The League of Nations failed. In World War II, there was an optimism that the Allies were fighting for the four freedoms, or they were fighting for the Atlantic Charter, or that they were going to rehabilitate Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union would be a partner and they would have so much power, these three powerful nations, that they could adjudicate the post-war world in a positive sense. So then World War II would sort of be the real war to end all wars. At least that was the idea of the UN Charter. That, of course, was a failure. The more people have been killed in wars since World War II than the 65 million who perished in that terrible six-year period. The United Nations, while some may argue is an improvement on the League of Nations by fact that it still exists and the way the League of Nations became obsolete and was ended by World War II, has not been able to either provide a moral or ethical model for governance on a global scale, much less has it been able to stop wars from breaking out or ending them when they do break out? It is not a coalition of democratic nations. It is a coalition of often authoritarian governments in which true democracies are in the minority. And many of its resolutions hardly are what we would call classically liberal. They're mean-spirited, they're punitive, and they're counterproductive. So the United Nations, if that was the purpose of World War II, is to make a perfect peace, that failed. If the purpose of World War II was to end authoritarianism, especially totalitarianism, then it failed. Because think of it this way. Britain declared war in Germany on September 2nd, 1939, to preserve the freedom of Poland and that is to stop German totalitarianism from absorbing Poland in the way that it had absorbed Czechoslovakia and in the way that it had undermined nations like Romania and hung Hungary. World War II ended by turning those countries over 
to the Soviet Union. And so we substituted, if I could be so general and so sloppy in terminology, we substituted a right-wing totalitarianism for a left-wing totalitarianism. In terms of blood on one's hands, Stalin, who had been knee-deep in the collectivizations of the 1920s, the show trials, the execution of the Russian military classes, of Polish civilians, he had more blood on his hands than Hitler did. And yet, World War II ensured that the Soviet Union would now control Eastern Europe. That was not the objective. And so in that way, World War II failed again. If the objective of World War II, however, on the other hand, was to stop Nazi Germany, to stop Italian fascism, and to stop Japanese militarism and to pre prevent them from killing millions of people, it sort of failed too, at least in the sense that it only stopped them after 50 to 55 million Chinese, Russians, Eastern Europeans, and Western Europeans had died. In other words, given the power of the Soviet Union that was displayed during the war and the power of the British Empire and the power of the United States, one asks, why couldn't that power have been expressed earlier in 1938, 39, 40, and it would have precluded the Axis head start or at least their ability to kill so many unarmed people. Had the United States had the military power that it had in 1943, in 1939, had Britain had the power displayed in 44, had it had that in 36, maybe we wouldn't have had place names like Belsen or Treblinka or Auschwitz. Maybe six million Jews would be alive today because the Third Reich wouldn't have dared try to start a war with such powerful allies. In that sense, uh, the agendas of World War II were a failure. But that said, if the agenda was to stop a costly mistake, that is, that prior European appeasement, prior American isolationism, prior Russian collusion out of naivete, self-interest, selfishness, laxity, any term you want to use might apply to the attitudes of the Allies prior to the war. Despite all that, if they finally wised up in the case of Britain in 39, in the case of the United States in 41, in the case of the Soviet Union in 41, and they saw that they were facing an existential threat in fascism and Nazism and Japanese militarism, and an existential threat that had a head start, and the purpose was to stop that, then World War II was a success. And remember how close they came to failing. So somewhere around 1941 to 1942, the Axis powers recalibrated and they said, my gosh, we're now in a war with the United States since December 11th, 1941. We are a war with the Soviet Union since June 21st of 1941, and we never conquered Great Britain. And we have not been able to bomb the enemy into submission, or even in some cases, even reach the enemy. So then what happened? Well, what happened would be then that there were two races, so to speak, concurrent races. In Japan and Italy and Germany, they recalibrated their strategic and industrial policy. Can we make a fighter that is so much better than anything that the Allies have? Can we have a new weapon? Can we have a new bomber that can somehow rectify our tragic mistake of taking on economic, industrial, and military powers beyond our comprehension in 1941? And there was an active discussion both in Germany and in Japan that something had gone wrong. These border wars that had been so successful in China, Southeast Asia, Europe, had now blossomed into something they hadn't quite conceived of. And the answer, as we're going to see, is going to be no. They did not build a four-engine bomber. They did not build fighters that were uh, capable of ensuring air supremacy. And they did not train pilots or maintenance crews that could ensure air supremacy. Meanwhile, in the United States, 
in Great Britain and the Soviet Union, there were quantum leaps in technology and industrial production. And remember one other thing is that the United States was 3,000 miles distant from Europe. Great Britain was always an island. So even though through isolationism and appeasement, the democracies were not really ready for World War II, there were people within them that understood would there ever be another war, you would have to have a means of hitting a European city that was hostile with bombs uh, from your own home bases, whether it was the United States or whether it would be in Britain. And that created a need for a four-engine bomber. So as early as 1936 and 37, the United States had developed this wonderful B-17 bomber. And Britain had experimented with the Hanley Page or the Stirling Short bombers. Again, four-engine bombers uh, were built as early as 1937 to 39 in the democracies, and the Axis had no counterpart to that. And that gave them a head start because from the B-17, you would get the B-24, and then later the B-29, and from the Sterling Short or the Hanley Page, you would go to the Manchester, then the Lancaster. So by 1944 and 45, when we talk about strategic bombing, we're essentially talking about an allied phenomenon. The Axis powers did not have the equipment, the technology, the training, or the expertise, and they simply ceased even trying to do it. And today I'd like to talk about the role of air power in the course of World War II. World War II, of course, is the word we use in America, and it's equivalent to the European or the British notion of a second world war. There's a couple of things to remember about air power before we begin in earnest. One is that there was an enormous transformation between its inaugural appearance in 1914 in World War I when pilots and biplanes shot revolvers at each other. In less than 30 years, about 25 years, 24 years, at the outbreak in September 1st of 1939 in World War II, we had monoplanes and the speeds had increased from 100 miles an hour to nearly 300, and people were firing about seven to 800 shots per minute on machine guns, sometimes right through the propeller, sometimes on the wings. And they were carrying bomb loads, in the case of fighter bombers, of 500 to 1,000 pounds, and bombers even far greater. So there was a miraculous transformation in the role of air power. And that created theorists or prophets, air prophets, or architects of air power, so to speak, in the European countries and in the United States as well. Billy Mitchell, Duet, Weaver in Germany, and they were so enthralled by this new weapon that they made a, a series of astounding predictions, and so much that Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin in the late 1930s said in despair that the bomber will always get through. And it was almost as if assets at sea, navies, and assets on the ground, infantry, were going to be secondary or even irrelevant. The war would take place up in the air. The problem with that is nobody lives up in the air, nobody eats in the air, nobody uh, really can fly. We don't have wings. So what you're doing is transferring label, labor and capital from the ground up into the air. And there has to be a purpose for that. And the purpose had to be either air superiority or air supremacy. And by that I mean your air forces had to beat the other person's air forces for the prime reason that they could then direct their assets to where things really mattered on the ground, taking cities or territory, or killing people or capturing them on the ground. If you couldn't do that and you only achieved air parity, then both sides were sort of wasting their time in an irrelevant theater. So the purpose was to build more planes and better planes and train better pilots to destroy the enemy's air assets, or at least weaken them so you had air superiority. And then the holy grail was air supremacy. That meant that you could put your assets up in the air, they could fly over the enemy's territory, destroy his cities or his armies on the ground, and they would be invulnerable because you had destroyed the enemy's ability to fight back in the air. And that was pretty much the theory of air power in World War II.
Well, beginning in World War I, uh, when aircraft first started firing at each other uh, with the Spads and the Newports and SE-5s, uh, those airplanes were relatively slow, in most cases under 100 miles per hour. The machine guns they used uh, fired very slow, and they were small, 30 calibers, and they had to do most of their dogfighting uh, in tail-on chases and get in very close in order to either kill the pilot or hit the engine or some part of the airplane that was critical. And from there, we went into World War II with faster airplanes uh, approaching 500 miles per hour and larger guns, 50 caliber machine guns, 20 millimeter cannon, 30 millimeter cannon. And uh, that became a little more lethal. And also, since the airplanes were faster, uh, our initial dogfighting in World War II, uh, a lot of the shooting was instinctive. You, you didn't have a lead computing gun sight, so you really didn't know how much to lead the airplane when you were firing at it. And uh, about the middle of World War II, we came out with lead computing gun sights that worked on the gyroscope principle, and the it was up to the pilot to put the proper uh, range into his gun sight to get proper lead. And that made it relatively easy to shoot down 109s and 190s with these lead computing gun sights. During World War II and pitting the P-51 against the Fokker 490 and the ME-109, uh, the P-51 had both advantages and disadvantages. Uh, number one, the P-51 had long range. On the other hand, it made the airplane extremely difficult to fly when you had a heavy fuel load. Uh, we had an 85-gallon fuselage tank in the P-51, and until you got that tank about half empty, you had a very aft center of gravity, which made the airplane unstable. And since you did have roughly eight hours of fuel, it let you stay with the bombers all the way in. Now, the speed between the two airplanes, uh, the P-51 was a little faster than the 109-190, and could turn with it if you were down on fuel. If you had a full load of fuel, you were in trouble. The P-51 carried six 50 caliber machine guns that fired around 850 rounds per minute, and uh, they were armor-piercing incendiary bullets that penetrated deep into the ME-109 or 190 that you were fighting, and it did a lot of damage to the internal mechanism in the airplane. Some of the other advantages that we had in the P-51, we wore G-suits which gave us the capability or kept us from blacking out at, at about four and a half Gs. Uh, you could see to shoot another airplane down while pulling as high as five and a half to six Gs, whereas the German fighter pilots never received G suits and were at quite a disadvantage in dogfighting at high G loads. Uh, also, the P-51 was equipped with a lead computing gun sight uh, by the summer of 1944 which made it relatively easy to hit the guy at high angle lofts of deflection shooting. I can't think of any disadvantages that the 109 and 190 had. They were good airplanes, but uh, as I mentioned before, they were not as fast as the P-51. Uh, they didn't have the range of the P-51. And you got to remember, the ME-109 and the 190s were designed as interceptors to shoot down bombers. They were very good in between fighter to fighter uh, because they were quite maneuverable. But since they were firing against bombers, they used cannon shells more than uh, the smaller caliber guns that we used in the P-51. And those cannon shells, such as a 20 millimeter cannon uh, and a 30 millimeter cannon, had a lot of explosive shrapnel when they hit the thin skin in the B-17s and B-24s. And consequently, uh, during aerial combat, I think we were at a big advantage with the P-51 by firing 50 caliber machine guns, which were armor-piercing incendiary, uh, that penetrated deep into the internal organs of the ME-109 or 190. Uh, whereas if we got hit with a 20 millimeter shell, it merely uh, shredded uh, the skin on your airplane and you didn't have very deep penetration. Uh, into the internal organs of your P-51. As far as the capability of the airplane, the P-51, that airplane probably, more than anything else, changed the tide of the war in World War II. During the Korean War, for the first time we pitted 
jet against jet, primarily the F-86 Sabre against the MiG-15. The speeds of these airplanes were much faster than during World War II. They were approaching the speed of sound. And uh, as far as the two airplanes were concerned, uh, the F-86 Sabre had a big advantage over the MiG-15 in it, that it had a flying tail, uh, meaning the whole horizontal stabilizer moved up and down when you moved the control stick. And what this did, it gave the F-86 the capability of maneuvering in the region of the speed of sound. Uh, whereas the MiG-15 had a fixed horizontal stabilizer and an elevator to control the airplane, and any time that the airplane was above about 93% of the speed of sound, uh, it lost its elevator effectiveness and couldn't maneuver. And this gave the F-86 a big advantage since a lot of the dogfighting was done in, in dives uh, uh, above .93 Mach number. Basically, the F-86 had a, a big advantage over the MiG-15 speed-wise, but on the other hand, the MiG-15 had an advantage in it that it could turn tighter than the F-86 and had a, a better acceleration rate because it had more thrust versus the weight of the airplane. But on the other hand, the F-86 was a faster airplane when it was stabilized. Uh, as far as the armament on the airplanes, uh, the F-86 still carried 650 caliber machine guns and the MiG it carried a, a couple cannon, which had slower cyclic rate of firing than the F-86 had. Basically, they were very close, and uh, really pilot proficiency didn't enter in to the Korean War as much as it did during World War I and definitely during World War II. During Vietnam, when we used the F-4 Phantom II and the F-105 against airplanes like the MiG-17, MiG-19, and MiG-21, uh, you have to go back a little bit. After Korea, uh, what we did, we built dual role airplanes, meaning these airplanes were designed for both air to ground and air to air. And uh, by designing these airplanes with a dual role mission, uh, we uh, handicapped them in both roles, uh, meaning they weren't as good as an airplane that was purely dedicated to air-to-ground and obviously weren't very good in air-to-air -air combat because they had a weight disadvantage. Now the MiG-19 uh, and the MiG-21 that uh, the uh, North Vietnamese uh, were flying obviously had a big advantage in air-to-air -air combat over our F-4s and F-105s because they were dedicated strictly to air superiority. They could out, out turn, out maneuver both the F-4 and the F-105. Uh, one other disadvantage we had uh, was that we had left the gun off of the F-4 Phantom II because we equipped it with missiles and then we caught ourselves uh, during the end of uh, the Vietnam conflict uh, with gun parts added on to our airplanes to give us some capability in aerial combat and in the case of the F-4E Phantom, we put the 20 millimeter Gatling gun in the nose of the airplane. The F-4 Phantom II was designed with uh, air-to-air -air missiles, such as the AIM-7 radar beam riding missile and the AIM-9 uh, infrared heat seeking missile. Consequently, during the development of both of those missiles, uh, they operated uh, satisfactorily, uh, meaning you took off and flew them on one mission and fired them. But when we used those missiles in Vietnam, uh, taking those missiles up on many, many sorties uh, to 40,000 feet, 60 below zero, and then bringing them back to in the high humidity of the jungle environment, uh, after many, many missions, uh, these missiles uh, then begin to fail. And our success rate in the missiles, uh, fired within the correct envelope, uh, was less than 10 percent, which is very, very sorry. And consequently, uh, another disadvantage that we had, uh, not necessarily in aerial combat, was the capability to deliver a weapon with precision on a target on the ground. Those weapons guidance systems that were designed for the F-4 and the F-105 were designed for nuclear weapons, whereas if you hit within a mile of where you aimed, uh, it was satisfactory. And when we were restricted to using uh, iron bombs in Vietnam, uh, 
we didn't have the capability in those airplanes to deliver that armed bomb precisely enough to where it did any damage. And this brought about, of course, then smart weapons uh, or laser-guided or EWO-guided weapons uh, that we saw used so successfully in, in Iraq. The best combat pilot uh, that I ever flew with, I think, was was uh, Bud Anderson. Uh, there were we had a lot of good fighter pilots in our squadron in the group, but I think the best was Bud Anderson, and the reason was he had excellent eyesight, uh, was really aggressive, and could fly very good. On the ground, the guy was a, you know just as almost mild as could be. But you get him in the air, and he was a real vicious individual when he got in the cockpit of an airplane. But that eyesight he had was comparable to mine. We could see things many, many miles farther than any of the other pilots in the squadron, and it paid off. Andy used to refer to World War II combat, in our case, uh, the college of life and death, uh, meaning that you matured very fast. and. Uh, also, it just so happened that about half the pilots that went over with you got killed. Uh, you can't let your emotions affect what you're doing whatsoever. Duty enters into the picture probably more than anything else. It's, you know you have to do the job, and you don't uh, let your worry about the outcome enter into it because any time that you don't have any control over the outcome of something, forget it. You're, you're wasting your time worrying about it or even thinking about it. You better concentrate on what you're doing at that time to stay out of that uh, fatal end that you, you could think about. And uh, another trait that you saw happen in, in a fighter squadron such as ours, that there's no close friendship whatsoever. Uh, because if you got close to a guy, uh, he got killed, and it hurt very bad. So you didn't get close to anybody. You were strictly professional. You admired guys uh, for their professionalism and, and combat capability, but uh, you most certainly didn't get close to them on the ground or in the air. And uh, it, it, it was a good college uh, to teach you how to stay alive if you were able to. The first time I shot down an airplane, obviously, was on my seventh mission. Uh, we'd been escorting bombers uh, in the P-51B, some in occupied France. Uh, we were getting into Leipzig, Germany. And on uh, March 4th, 1944, we made the first daylight raid on Berlin. The uh, weather was very bad, and I ended up uh, with one other pilot on my wing, and we picked up the box of B-17s that we were supposed to escort, and I really didn't see any other P-51s around, but they were all scattered out. And we took this box of bombers uh, all the way to Berlin, and uh, I'd spotted ME 109s and 190s uh, on a pre couple of other missions, but we were never able to get to them before they got in the clouds or, or got away from us. And on this particular day, uh, I had a wingman with me, uh, and we were above the bombers. And in fact, we were ranging out in front of the bomber stream. They'd dropped their bombs and were coming back out of the, the, the target area. And I spotted a uh, ME 109 uh, down under us about 5,000 feet, basically going the same direction we were going. And with the P-51B that I was flying, I had four 50 caliber guns. And uh, being it was my first combat, I opened up full power on the P-51, started diving down this 109, and, and before I knew it, my overtake speed must have been a couple hundred miles an hour faster than his. And, and uh, so I was closing up way too fast. I didn't have time to shoot or anything, so I pulled, pulled the power back and pulled the airplane up just as tight as I could into a big spiral and rolled over, and it's dropped down under him and pulled a nose up from about 100 feet back and opened up with the 50 calibers and just chewed the whole bottom out of that P-50 or the ME-109. And it was, it was interesting since it was the first airplane I shot down, the pieces that come off and 
first thing I knew, I was in a hazardous position being back under this thing with all these pieces falling by, and I pulled out to the side, and then the airplane started burning, and the pilot bailed out. Then I uh, pulled back up, and my wingman joined me, and we split up, or we scattered out, and started coming back, and I spotted a, a Heinkel 111K, uh, a twin-engine bomber, down low, going in and out of the clouds. So we dropped down, and I started closing in on this 111K, and it was a top turret gunner sh shooting, and I pulled in, I uh, pulled out to the side, and was kind of zigzagging back and forward so he couldn't see me. And I pulled in behind and opened up, and I only had one 50 caliber firing. The others were jammed. And I did get hits on the engine and, and part of the fuselage and probably killed the tail gunner. Uh, and the airplane then went into the clouds, and I never saw it anymore. But then we worked our way back to England and uh, made our lead down in bad weather and finally found our base and landed. And that was the first airplane I shot down, and the combat film was very good, so I got confirmed, and my wingman confirmed that the guy bailed out of it. That was my first kill. And the next day was March the 5th. We had a mission down in uh, Bordeaux, and, and I tangled with uh, a bunch of Fockwolf 190s and made a head-on pass with them, and I got hit with a bunch of 20-millimeter cannon shells and uh, lost uh, the canopy, part of the left wing, and the prop, and the engine caught on fire, so I bailed out of it and and, and it came down. And then the next, it, many months elapsed, uh, and the next kill I got was a JU-188, and it was sort of illegal, really. I, I sh was not cleared to fly combat. I had evaded and came back to England through Gibraltar, and they were moving me back to my squadron, waiting on permission to go back on combat. And in the meantime, we were getting in new pilots, so I picked up three new pilots, and I was taking them up, training them in combat tactics. And uh, we were up above the base just fooling around, and uh, got a call from from base ops uh, on the radio uh, that there was a B-17 had ditched up just off of Helgoland uh, in the Balkans, and uh, would I take my flight of three up there and... and circle the dinghy while the British sent an air rescue boat out to pick them up. And we did, and we were up there circling at about 5,000 feet above the dinghy. I had the B-17 crew in it, and I spotted a Ju-188 uh, twin-engine uh, fighter bomber uh, coming out on the right very low on the water towards the dinghy. And uh, so when I spotted him, I was flying a P-51D for the first time, which had 650s. Uh, and so I told my wingman to scatter out, uh, to spread out so they could watch about my tail and their tail too, so if other aircraft were coming in. And I headed up towards the 188. He saw us coming. He turned around and headed back for the uh, Helgoland as low and as fast as he could go. And I closed in up under him and blew him up just as he crossed over the coast and the airplane rolled up on the beach and they were shooting flak at us and we peeled back up and then got down on the low on the water and got out of there and came back and landed and uh, and uh, I had to give the airplane to another pilot because I wasn't authorized to fly off combat. So. But it was an interesting mission uh, in that the new pilots got to see an airplane in combat and it sort of got them hardened a little bit to it. On a particular mission where I got five ME 109s in one day, as I was leading the squadron, we had uh, a mission to escort two boxes of B 17s. And uh, since uh, there were three squadrons in my fighter group, uh, I put one squadron on the lead box and the other squadron on the second box, and then took my squadron of 16 P 51s and ranged out in front of the bomber stream. 50 to 75 miles, and it just normally that's where the f German fighter pilots would form up into gaggles. And I spotted uh, 22 ME 109s uh, climbing up at about 21,000 feet. We were sitting up around 30,000 feet. Since we were up sun from them, I don't think they saw us at the time, and uh, I just kept my squadron together and uh, started trailing them and closing up on them. 
And uh, when we got within a couple hundred yards or firing distance, uh, I opened up on one 109 and hit him, and he broke and hit another uh, 109 and uh, had a collision with him. And then at that time, uh, when the 109s realized that uh, we were P-51s, they all broke, uh, and we got into a, a dogfight. And I recall uh, being on the closing in on another 109, getting hits on him, and his wingman cut his power and was backing up. Well, I cut my power and kicked full rudder and pulled in very close to him and sort of sawed him in two. And, and then uh, we broke out again, and I started chasing another 109, took him down to the deck and uh, probably killed the pilot because the airplane flew into the ground, blew up. And then in climbing back out, uh, we spotted uh, 16 Focke 190s uh, uh, that actually got into the clouds uh, before we got within the uh, firing range of them. And I think uh, the one thing that happened, I think the ME-109, since we were sort of working out of the sun on them, thought we were 16 Focke-Wolf 190s trying to rendezvous with them. And they let us get in among them before they realized we were, we were P-51s. One of the uh, most interesting missions that I flew uh, was where I shot, shot down uh, four Focke Wolf 190s. Uh, I think the reason was, was uh, the people that were involved in the mission. Uh, Bud Anderson was leading the squadron. Uh, Jim Browning was leading white flight. Don Bakke was leading blue flight. And I was leading green flight. Well, the four of us were roommates in a Nissan hut. And between the four of us, we had 63 Germans shot down. And uh, basically, our mission on that particular day, we had 48 P-51s, or three squadrons of 16 each. And we were escorting uh, 48 other P-51s, which had a drop tank and a 500-pound bomb. And we were going deep into Poland to hit some underground fuel storage areas. And our job was just to escort the P-51s that were carrying the bomb. And uh, evidently, uh, we were up around 35,000 feet uh, above the bomb-carrying P-51s at max range cruise, which meant we were slowed down. And uh, evidently, the German radar and intelligence uh, thought it was one large gaggle of B-17s with no escort. And they scrambled a, a pretty good fighter force to hit it. And that fighter force consisted of about 150 Focke 190s and about 50 109s. And the first time we spotted these fighters coming out, they were around 11, 11 o'clock, 11.30 position. And Andy and I were, were watching. It looked like a cumulus cloud because they were pulling contrails and coming. But then we started seeing the little spots in the contrails, and we knew there were Germans in it. And when we first began to see this thing get bigger, 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 uh, it looked like a real gaggle of fighters, which it was. And what we did, they were coming at about 11 or 11.30, and uh, since I'm sitting over here in green flight, Bakke is in blue, and Andy leading the squadron in a flight over here, uh, when they came in on our left, Andy told us to punch off our tanks, which we did, and then everybody broke into the, the gaggle, and that put me right in the middle of them, and it was, it was a good dogfight. Uh, there's airplanes going every way, and uh, I don't remember in what sequence I shot down the four 190s. Anyway, it was, it was uh, in some of the combat film, 16 millimeter combat film, you can see as high as 38 airplanes going all different directions, both P-51s and, and uh, 190s and 109s. And uh, in the dogfight, uh, you know, you get one guy, get him burning or the pilot bails out and then you pick another one or try to get on his tail. And in the meantime, your wingman is with you and trying to keep German fighters off your tail and his tail, too. So a lot of chatter going on and a, and a lot of maneuvering. And uh, after the last uh, 190 that I took to the deck was trying to get away from me, I finally uh, either killed the pilot or damaged his airplane to the point where it hit the ground and blew up. After shooting down the last Falk Wolf 190, it was a clear day, and uh, you could see all of the burning fighters uh, just scattered, you know, for a long stream down through towards Leipzig, Germany. 
And it was uh, one of the better dog fights. Anyway, I ended up all by myself. My wingman got lost in the hassle. Uh, he didn't get shot out. He just lost me and then ended up back at the base later on. But uh, the interesting thing was uh, while I was climbing out by myself, I still had some ammunition left. And, and I climbed back up to 36,000 feet and started heading west to get back to England. And I spotted these three little tiny airplanes up north. And I, since I had ammunition left, I just started turning, heading up north. And the minute I turned my P-51 up like that, I heard Andy say this single bo bogey down south. And I asked him, did he have two airplanes with him? He said, yes. And I asked him to waggle his wings, and that was Andy and Bakke and Browning left. And I joined up with them, and we came home. The four flight leaders came home together. And I think between the four of us, we had about 11 or 12 airplanes. During that period, uh, the fall of 1944, uh, we probably were at our peak because we flew every day, six, seven hours, in the same airplane, and we'd shot down uh, quite a few German airplanes, and uh, we probably were the most highly experienced fighter pilots that ever existed. And uh, you knew you could handle anything that the Germans could throw at you. And you could handle any, any German pilot that came up in any kind of an airplane because, it, you know, you demonstrated it. And uh, since you flew so much in one particular airplane, you really peaked out in it. And uh, probably that combination of the pilot and the airplane no other time prior to or since then have a bunch of fighter pilots really been proficient in doing their mission. And we really felt at home in the sky. You want your safe space. The last thing you want is somebody invading your campus. You should always feel like you're right. Freedom is not an abstraction. It affects our happiness and our ability to flourish. It is very seldom that liberty of any kind is lost all at once. It's always lost bit by bit. We have protection of freedom of speech. If we said only things that other people liked, we'd have no reason to protect it. Notice that when Jefferson looks for a source of our rights, can only find one, and that's the creator. We are a country that respects religious liberty. That key value has been enshrined in our founding documents. We are created equal in the eyes of God, the core principle of democracy. To believe that Islam is a religion of peace is to believe that Muslims throughout history have misunderstood their own religion. Life is the most fundamental right. None of the other rights that are listed in the Bill of Rights actually exist without first the right to life. Free markets fundamentally run on service, not to make everyone's outcomes equal. We are diverse people with diverse skills and diverse talents. Femininity is one of the graces of our world, one of the things that makes life worth living. Feminism has sucked all the joy out of that. They've attacked manliness itself. They've attacked the virtues. Virtue comes from vir, means man. To pretend that a man is a woman, if he believes he is a woman, nobody should be mistreated. But that's not the same thing as requiring that people say objectively untrue.